This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. This episode features a conversation with Nigel Wingrove. Nigel is an art director, filmmaker, author, and magazine editor. I wanted to chat with him because of his work with photographer Chris Bell and Cradle of Filth. I'm asking all of the key players in the era spanning the 1990s if they're keen for a chat. If you're new to what I'm doing here, that's what I'm up to. Hence, the Chronicles of Filth. Nigel is the essential player in carving out a visual identity for the band. Now, if you're watching via video, I'll carousel his images throughout this introduction. You will recognize many. Nigel's imagery was used across merchandise from the principle of evil made flesh up to and not including Cruelty and the Beast. And he created the album covers for the principle of evil made flesh, Vampire and Dusk. You'll hear why the band and Nigel went separate ways throughout the chat, so I'm not going to give that away here. Needless to say, we as fans, we have been gifted an extraordinary body of work. One can't help but think what might have been had Nigel continued to act as art director and Stu, Nick and Les if they'd stayed on in the band to craft that Clive Barker concept album and God knows what other majesty their imaginations would have conjured together. Just think about it. Nigel's a tremendous fella. I thoroughly enjoyed this chat and it took place at 3 a.m. Brisbane time, so I had to set a few alarms to make sure I didn't miss it. But no chance of that. I was so keen to talk to Nigel. And as I've said before, everyone that I've spoken to throughout the Chronicles of Filth is just fantastic. From Nick, Stu, God rest his soul, Greg, Woz, Ben, Paula Lender, Chris Bell, and now Nigel Wingrove. Let's go. There's such enormous interest by a cohort of fans. You may be aware of this, but Cradle of Filth is more or less a legacy act these days. The band that you were associated with has probably nothing to do with the band that's going around right now, save for one person, Danny. Danny, yeah. He's some, well, not somehow, I mean, he's been at the head of the table, so he's the one who's engineered things. That's the only way to describe it. And the band is all his these days. There's... Co-contributors yes. certainly, but uh, in uh, all but name, I'd say. And mm. that e- that era back then was seen as far more of a collaborative effort. And certainly the musicians are Stuart Anstis. I don't know whether you remember Stuart, Nick Barker. Well, because basically, well, I mean, I can go through it, but they when um, Cradle, because uh, I started Redemption, which is my you know horror label and stuff, mm. Start, I started trading in 93, but in 92, I started, because uh, my background was magazines, actually, was and, and then, then filmmaking. Um, but I started, i come up with the idea for Redemption in 92, and I kind of, when I get into something, because uh, I was making a transition then, if you like, from making my living from designing magazines and working in publishing to starting a film label, basically. And there was a transition period between basically deciding I'd had enough of um, magazines, or at least working in magazines or publishing. Partly there, was, there was also a recession in the UK. That was another, another, another motivating force. I couldn't, you know, wasn't able to earn as much money, you know, money again. Hmm. Um, but I started, because I kind of immersed myself in that, I basically I started a horror zine or a magazine, basically, around Redemption, which is a company I wanted to do. And I'd kind of immersed myself in horror culture by, the, by all the horror zines. And, it was that magazine, which is what where I created a lot of the images that Cradle used. Basically, that's what I'm trying to. That's, sorry, that's a point I was trying to make. In the sure. sense that, that that's how, because Danny, I think Danny contacted me. I can't remember exactly, but I think it was. It must have been either late '92 or early '93, because they what he wanted to do was to. He'd seen the pictures I'd done, or you know created it and put it for the magazine and he want they wanted to license some of those initially for the um principally made, made flesh that was basically the you know the cover shot basically which I, mm-hmm. and that because that picture i'd shot for a you know for an article on vampire films basically mm-hmm. gotcha you know, yeah which, which I, well chris has shot it but i mean i you know that i'd conceived you know the, the picture for for and um, commissioned it you know for for an article on vampire films so that's basically how mm-hmm. it came about you know yeah. So so your introduction to Chris and your work with Chris preceded the work with Cradle of Filth, obviously. 
Yeah, well, Chris, I've, I've worked, just to go back to my magazine uh, period, I mean, I, I was at art school in the, during the punk period and did a fanzine and then moved to London, you know, like lots of people do, to, to seek my fortune, if you like, and magazines is what I wanted to do. So I I worked um, very briefly for Cosmopolitan and I worked for, uh, but I ended up primarily with a, um, a Dutch company called VNU, who are quite a big business magazine publishing. But they... Um, but they were very nice to me, have to, I have to say. And uh, one of the, they had a lot of computer mags. And Chris was one of the people they used. As, you know, was one of the, was a sort of photographer that did a lot of work for for BNU basically. And uh, so, and Chris was a studio photographer basically. That was thing. But I, the, but that was why. So he was one of several photographers that we that I worked with there. But I particularly liked Chris. And so, um. And I was looking for, although I could do, I, I had my own sort of section at VNU and I was, they were very good to me. So I could do, you know, a lot of things. Obviously it was primarily a, about computers or business publications. So although I could be creative within that area, it wasn't, you know, I couldn't really go wild, you know, wild because of the subject matter. So I was looking around for a vehicle for my imagery because that's what, that's basically what I did anyway. I was, I, I when I was a, um, at art school, I created, I was always creating weird images, you know, that's what I like doing, particularly with, with women. And um, uh, and I also did punk fanzine and I had my um, girlfriend at the time on the on the cover and you know, all the stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know, so I was always playing, that's why I like to play around with things. So when I was in London, I was trying to find a vehicle where I could basically show people what I did, you know, and uh, there was, um, you know, there'd been the the punk scene had been going on when I was at art school. And because when I got to London, it was into the it was 79, 80, the punk scene was kind of well, the core scene was moving out and it was evolving. It evolved into the um, new romantic sort of thing, you know, with bands like Culture Club and Spandau Ballet and things like that. But I, mm-hmm. I was lucky enough through, through um, meeting a girl at um, uh, Blitz Club that, um, uh, she she was a girl that designed all the uh, Sue Clowes basically a girl who designed all the clothes for Culture Club, and I so I did another magazine there and I started creating images for that called Homage and I, I, I published that and then um, and then I, that got me a job at VNU, but I was looking for something else and um, the, um, the this new club started up I mean really underground stuff I'm talking about not like a big club but a tiny you know fetish mm-hmm. club called Into. And there was one called Maitress, and I they basically had a magazine, which was of people, you know, called Skin Two, which is basically for people into rubber and leather and fetish, you know, that sort of lifestyle. Mm. So I, I looked. And it was, I mean, it's just really. I'm, I'm talking something really, like really underground. You can only buy it at the club or you know within the scene. It wasn't like a, a mainstream magazine, but nonetheless, I I saw it and contacted them and said, look, I'd like to redesign it, you know, basically, and. Mm. Um, and I was doing pretty well by then, and had you know, so I, I, I didn't want any money for doing. It. I just wanted, an, I just wanted an opportunity to basically do something that I could create and show what I could do. So I did, and um, you know, I created their logo and all the typography and stuff. But also, I want, you know, I needed to do. I wanted the, the imagery, and by that time, I because I'm an art director essentially, so I'll come up with the idea and you know, and then and I really liked Chris's black and white because you say he would shoot stuff you know portraits of business people and there were several photographies but I particularly like Chris and the other thing was he did a lot of studio work you know shooting mm-hmm. you know people or, or still lives basically in the studio but it was very you know so he had a good studio so basically I said to Chris look I've got to do these I want to do some stuff with skin too um so it's obviously completely out of his normal area you know but I basically so I basically I did um I, you know I come up with an idea for the first cover I did for skin too which was basically a, a girl with two two latex hands you know like this mm. like a prayer thing but of course that was with Chris because he was a good studio photographer I could sort of say like this is what I wanted and he'd you know it'd be beautifully lit and I'd get a really good you know strong image and that worked for me and then we did then we did a, a shot that became very famous for skin too which was a uh, a girl's sort of leg with a stiletto heel you know it was like stoop, you know and it had a really mm. strong image and again for me this was about this on this is what 84 i guess 84 85 so i basically did a lot of work with chris on on the skin too because i paid for these shoots you know but it was basically you know i'd come up with the ideas but i could work with chris because 
I knew that the technical stuff would all be done. It would be nicely lit. I'd get a really good, strong image. And there's a difference later. You know, when you, I, I went out with a uh, girlfriend, uh, uh, Couple had a good relationship with her, um, quite a lot of art photographers. And there was a good girl I, um, I'd met who did a lot of work with Daniel Dax, who I worked, ended up work, doing some work with as well. She was with a band called the Lemon Kittens, then became Daniel Dax, you know, in her own right. But a girl called Holly Warburton, photographer, used to do, did all her covers and she used to photograph, um, go to the morgue actually, photographs like, like um, skin textures and stuff. But Holly was like, if you like, very much an art photographer and there were some other ones as well like that but with it with a very very strong sort of and i say this in a get this i need to do this anyway disrespectfully at all but if you have somebody who's a photographer who has a particular vision and they have a style that's you know that they're doing you know they're using their photography to, if you like to create a sort of art art image and if you're coming along like me saying i want this it's difficult to control because they have their, sure. they're bringing something more, you know. So it became quite tricky. So working with Chris was much, uh, was much cleaner and purer for me because I could conceive exactly what I wanted. I put and put the shoot together. You know, I put the models, put the setting, you know, sketch it all out, work out exactly what I wanted. And then Chris would bring his technical skills and everything to make sure, you know, it, it would be absolutely what I wanted. You know, so it became, and that worked for me. I was, that worked for me as a creatively and i obviously it was, it was chris i think for chris it was i was obviously it was different from the normal stuff he did you know so i could turn up with a, a couple of you know some good looking girls and we do a good shoot but i knew i'd always the bottom line was i'd get a good picture you know from that shoot so basically we did all the work with skin too and then i also got i, I moved up in the in in the work i was doing to um a much a new publisher called redwood and they were funded by um, Acorn Computers at the time, and they had uh, a house magazine that they they basically brought me in to redesign called a a Acorn User. And I had a again, I had a quite a free hand there, so I did more work with Chris then on on, on more more I guess in his area, and of course other conferences <laughs> as well. But carried on my relationship with them. And then I went to work. Then I um, I moved to Paris, so it. Um, uh, essentially didn't stop but I was doing work out there and I started I was using some other photographers and stuff but I remember and I can't remember exactly what then I started making some films and uh, various things and that kind of carried on I think until um uh the early 90s and I I also worked for a, um, a publisher called Macmillan's and did work for them. I don't I think I did as much work with Chris during that period. So basically nothing really happened. Uh, I was using other photographers and other things were going on until I did I did The Redeemer, basically, which is my magazine, mm -hmm. uh, which I did actually. Uh, I'll, send, I'll send you pictures. Of this that was this was the first issue of The Redeemer that I did, basically. Oh, lovely, and yeah. I published myself. And obviously we created, I, I mean, I'd worked, uh, that's Eileen's girlfriend at the time, but obviously with without her eyes in. Um, <laughs> but we created that, you know, the logo, which I did. And we did, I mean, I had, because I, I was I was financing all this, so I didn't, I really didn't have, you know, these are, this was the shoot that everybody knows, you know, this one and um, this picture here, you know, which became the thing. I'll send you pictures of these, obviously, but yeah. that 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 shoot, I remember, I, I, I always remember that day, not, not because of particularly that shoot, but there was... Um, we had to do it on a Sunday morning, and I lived in Soho at the time with Eileen. And um, we had a one of the models that we'd booked. We, I think Chris was quite busy, and we, we only he, so we had to do it on a Sunday, which was very unusual. We normally do it a, not work on a weekday, so we, we arranged it on a Sunday morning. And the we booked two. I booked two models, um, and one rang up. You know, probably she got 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 wasted the night before and said she couldn't. You know, she said she was ill. You know, and so yeah, we sure. had to grab a neighbour literally a girl that we knew from across the road and somebody had to um, look after her kid for her while she came, you know, kindly came to our rescue. And then we had, um, uh, an Eileen came, you know, came, came as well to do some modeling. And, um, the, we were doing this and, and I'd never used, um, blood in a shoot before. In fact, I don't think anybody, it just something that just wasn't done. And I wanted these girls, and we, again, we, we had no budget, and we were shooting in black and white. Um, and we used coffee, basically, which is one, one thing. But oh, one right. of the girls in the shoot, um, I remember, basically, because we were short of girls, basically, models. And she was, um, 
uh, this girl here, this 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 girl is called Michelle, and okay. um, this one here was actually a, I think she was a student who had, who was helping Chris out that day, like as a photographer's assistant, you know. Mm. And she very kindly said she'd step in, you know. So she wasn't even a you know she was just a photographer's assistant, you know, who luckily was very un you know uninhibited and uh, mm. uh, got a got a got a clothes off, and basically allowed, allowed us to pour coffee over her. So that's. That's essentially how that shoot came about. And as I say, so that was, um, and it was, as I say, it was for the, the magazine. And what Cradle, what happened was that Danny was, I'm assuming Danny saw, obviously, obviously saw the magazine. And I started Redemption in 93. Um, uh, and um, I was shooting all the covers, you know, for the video covers. And Chris, I was doing those with Chris. And I had, so we had yeah. that very distinctive black and white look, you know, which I liked. And, uh, and because and Redemption actually started doing very well very quickly. So I was shooting not just the covers for or doing shoots, not just for the, the video covers, as they then were, but also for the next issue of the Redeemer. Because we um we also did a calendar, you know, I got a bit carried away actually. So we did <laughs> shooting a lot. And um basically when Danny came to see us, I mean you have to bear in mind, I, I had very little money then. It was really difficult for me. So um, when Danny came along, so we, and he didn't have any money. I mean, the cradle didn't ex- exist as it, well, they did exist, but they, they were tiny, you know, in those, yeah. those early days. So it, it, it was very small money that I got for the pictures, but it was a help to me, you know, hundred quid here, hundred quid there was, you know, when you, when you, when you haven't got much money, that's, that's, you know, it's an, it's a little bit extra money, you know? So that, that was essentially how it all came about. I mean, Danny would come through and, basically so can we use that one and that one initially it was just for the the the, the um just just Princi- you know, principle of evil made flesh, evil made flesh. Yeah. and then he started asking if they could license some for t-shirts and again these were i was letting them go for really you know uh, nothing you know we're not not mm-hmm. nothing but very small amounts of money and that's how it sort of basically started so there wasn't a um there wasn't a big relationship in the sense of uh, um a working thing because he was essentially asking if they could license existing pictures that I'd either shot for the magazine or we'd done for a you know a leftover for one of the shoots we'd done mm. for one of the covers or something else, you know, because I was shooting a lot of stuff. I was quite busy uh, and I had quite a good team around me. You know, I'd create, you know, the, uh, a particular stylist um that I was working with who, and again who's really good at making clothes you know I'd come up with something and he'd do that and I had so basically I had a good team of people you know and um mm. it, it worked well so we just we were just creating uh good stuff but it, it, it was only I mean it, it grew later um I, I mean I thought about this because I knew I'd be speaking to you I mean I'm trying to think the 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 only I think there are about two or three pictures that I shot specifically for Cradle that Danny had asked me to do there was one of a girl which again I, i'll send you a picture of it but you'll probably know it there was a shot because they did a they did a funny ep i forgot what it's called a Vamp- vampire is it an yeah, ep that was, um, yeah. to get out of their contract with uh cacophonous or something they had spot on some... yep you know it. yep yeah. so that that i'd done some shoots um which i think which i shot around for my calendar i think but there were a few that danny wanted one was um a particular one he did he did ask me to do and i come up with some sketches which i've still got actually which i'll send to you um of a girl looking in the mirror with a sort of vampire like a witch girl vampire or gothic okay. girl if you like in a very very gothic mirror with all cobwebs and things mm-hmm. that one i shot specifically for cradle um i think the shot that's on the cover of vampire with a sort of girl with the, the wings which is actually just some cloth beautiful yeah, shot yeah, yeah, but those, I, I don't know. I don't know if we did it for the calendar or what. I don't think. I, I'm not sure. I don't think it was. We did it specifically for for the um, vampire, but the, the, the certainly the shot with the um, the mirror was. Um, and then I think I think also that at that stage by that time, Cradle were beginning to get involved with um, a t-shirt manufacturer called Rasmataz. And, and Vampirotica. You talk. You going talking about the Vampirotica label that they then set up, or is this another? Yeah, I, I'd forgotten that actually, because that, that was a big event they had at um, uh, in London. They had I didn't go to. I only went to it. I remember that. <laughs> I can't remember because it was because also during this period, Redemption was taking off. I mean, we'd gone. I'd gone from um, 
I was still working, basically. I was still working for VNU. I mean, I, I was running Redemption. I mean, VNU were very good to me, I have to say, but they were allowing me to run Redemption in my lunch hour, basically. So I was designing this and, you know, all the using their computers and stuff to do in my <laughs> lunchtime to do the covers for Redemption and and um, the magazine. So, I mean, I was literally, uh, so I'd be getting up early, doing some work on Redemption or whatever, going in, because the, the VNU were based in Soho as well, which is where I live, so I could, basically do some work there, go down to VNU, um, do, do some work at lunchtime, work it. And then when you, when I finished there, I could work because there's always, you know, it's a big editorial office, so people there were quite late, you know, so I could work work on the computer sort of eight or nine, then I'd come home, you know. So it was, um, uh, it, 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 there, there was, I say, money was very tight, but it gave me, you know, I was obviously earning money, so I, but I was using all the money to sort of run redemption, you know, run redemption or uh, try and get redemption going. I didn't stop working at VNG, I think, till '94, because when redemption was started to, you know, earn enough that I could, it would support me, you know, I could buy my own computer basically to have at mm-hmm. home. And I think, because basically, I remember Eileen and I lived in a it was a nice flat, but it was a top floor flat, a uh, smallish flat in um, in Soho. And so Danny and the, the rest of the band were sort of, we were on the top floor, so they'd trape all the way up the stairs, you know, and I had this little <laughs> office that all, you know, come come around in there. So not, not all dressed up, obviously, but in there, you know, round, and I'd even, I'd even make them a cup of tea, you know, and they would um, <laughs> sit around and go through all the pictures and decide, you know, what it was they they wanted. But it, it, it started to change, um, I think, well, several things started to happen. I think probably they got, they were getting bigger and they got, um, they signed with, is it some um, music, music for nations? nations? Yep. Yeah. They were getting bigger. They were obviously doing quite well on their T-shirts and stuff. And we were getting bigger as, a, you know, Redemption was just starting to do quite well. And so there was just a lot going on. And I think, um, I don't remember what, what really changed it. We, we had, or I, I got involved with somebody, you know, I think, with the best of intentions, um, suggested bringing this girl that he was that he was seeing, uh, but it also it worked in film anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Helped me sort of run things. Now, unfortunately, she had a how can I put this a very abrasive attitude with people, and sometimes mm-hmm. it would work; and it would generate you know stuff, and other times it would completely fuck things up. And unfortunately, um, with Cradle, that's what she did. But there was a before just before that happened there was a good period because cradle signed music for nations and they wanted to do um dusk and her embrace mm-hmm. and for the first so for the first time there was a decent budget there you know there was a budget that i could actually get my teeth into danny um to be fair to you know, danny he, he always had a, a specific vision with particularly as the band were growing you know he had a he knew what he wanted um but it was all, you know, he'd commissioned or they'd, they'd licensed permission to use these shots of castles and sort of things like that, which I could, you know, comp in with the thing. But they gave me um, uh, a sort of rough idea of what they wanted, which was this, you know, sort of girl with the forest and stuff. But hmm. I, enough that I had freedom to sort of, you know, I wanted the sort of growing out of the forest, if you like. And uh, I spoke to, uh, to a guy called Spencer Horn, who was my stylist, who did all, who was, you know, worked for me continually for all this period. So we basically, we, you know, we, I had the money to get a good model. We had the money to get a, uh, you know, a good, really good makeup artist uh, set. I used, I didn't work with Chris on this one. I worked with a guy called Salvatore, who was more uh, fashion orientated in a yeah. sense, because it was, it was, um, well, the, the, it was basically um I don't know this it was just it, it just seemed you know with the with the, all the girls and stuff it was because that wasn't Chris, Chris's area to be fair to Chris, Chris was fine but it was with this one it felt that we needed you know we um I just wanted to try out you know different things and with the fashion photography you have more flair with the with girls and a sense more movement and uh hey do you remember was, Sal- salvatore's surname at all because he's only listed as salvatore on on wikipedia that's yeah that's basically i've got i'll i'll look that up for you because um it was through salvatore that i'd done i just why did i start working with Salvatore? i can't remember how how we came about how i came to work with salvatore because he was based in clap his studio was in clapham uh not that that makes any difference to it but i try i can never quite remember how how I started working with him, whether I got it 
because it, there was a lot going on in my life at this because you know, I've been in France. I'd done. Um, mm. uh, we're talking. This is before I met Eileen. So we're talking. We're not, hang on, I'm gonna get, let's get my brain around all this work as to where I. No, I was with Eileen then. Sorry. Uh, to, this is ninety five, ninety six. Um. So. I can't. I'm, I'm sorry. I was just trying to wrap my brains as to how I how I actually met Salvatore. But, but basically, I know that I'd done some. Sh- I'd shot because we had, I created. Um, we had the redemption film label. Then I had Jezebel, um, and each uh, label, I, I kind of had a, um, a a girl to represent. You know, Eileen represented redemption, which is the sort of you know, the white eyed sort of redemption logo. Then I had Jezebel, which is maybe sort of kitschy. I guess sex films from the sixties and seventies. We had a sort of fallen, fallen uh, nun sort of thing, which is the image for um, Jezebel. Then mm-hmm. I created Purgatory, which was basically adult material, strong adult material, and we created the Purgatory Girl, which had this big rubber, uh, rubber hair and everything. It was very fetishistic, but I can't, and um, Salvatore did the shoot for that, and that one of the models that he booked for the shoot. We discussed, but he. would um, uh, recommended her was an Australian girl called Rochelle, who was I mean, stunning. I thought beautiful girl, but also incredibly um, easygoing, very uninhibited, fantastic figure. And I, I just thought she was fantastic. And I remember we did the we did the the shoot for um, Purgatory, and I was just really impressed with her. And then the Music for Nations things came up, and we had the, we had booked this model for the cover. I can't remember her name, but it'll be in the credits somewhere. But mm-hmm. she was a, you know, a fashion model basically. And then we had to have a shoot for Inside, which was like the Last Supper thing. Yes, and uh, with the band, and there was a full Amazing band. Amazing shot that one, fantastic. Six or something. And Rochelle, as I say, she was just really good natured, friendly, um, and fabulous basically. And so that because I think. I've got to think we must have shot it over. I was thinking about this, I can't remember exactly, but we, we must have shot it over a couple of days. We wouldn't have been able to shoot it all in one day. Um and uh so we'd have that it was it was Rochelle, she's the girl in the you know the Pope Pope gear and everything. Mm. Um and uh yeah, so we basically did we 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 had to, you know, we shot shot all of that um on a separate day, you know, the the, the supper and that was that was with with uh, Rochelle and that was also Salvatore. So the um and that was the like the the big the big shoot which was fun to do and um it worked you know obviously i was very pleased with the 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 album and everything i thought it looked really good and um this girl that had been brought in i say girl this woman uh, brought in my company um obviously with my she wasn't forced on me but as i say there was a, there were a few issues which i won't go into but they were there were some problems with her but one of them was this as a very abrasive attitude, and I can't remember exactly um, how it came about because Danny and I had started talking about. I want to get this slightly wrong. Um, is it so, I don't know if it was an album they did or a track. Dead girls don't. Dead girls, something yeah. rather. Yeah, um, it was certainly a, a, an icon. It was iconography underneath uh, an image on a t-shirt. Yeah, well, basically, I days, think. Yeah, he, yeah. He he'd asked me to. Do that. I I wasn't. I remember I've still got it, um Danny's sketches and, and notes for this one. Um I remember I didn't I mean, because although I I work in horror and I'll do all the stuff with all the blood and everything else with the girls and things, I don't like I'm I i do not like sort of violence against women in that sense. I don't mind, you know, the sort of uh, there's either, either there's a, I remember I wasn't completely comfortable with that one, but nonetheless, that was the sh- the, the one of the shots that was being talked about because I'd also done. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm, I'm as I'm talking, things are it's quite a long time ago. All this. Um, one of the other shots I'd done for them during this during this period was the that Danny wanted a masturbating nun, which is I, I do, I, I do, the a iconic of festival nuns. masturbation very imagery, easy, yeah. very easy one for me. That one, so I remember, um, booking the girl, and it was it was an easy shot to do, basically, it was just a good, you know, um. I should mess with because it became that T-shirt, you know, um, Jesus yeah. is a gun T-shirt, which uh, mm-hmm. which I should also talk about in a minute because that had other <laughs> other ramifications for me. But uh, oh, really? yeah, so we were doing 
quite a lot. We were beginning to do more commissions. I was beginning to do more, you know, more commissions because Danny was, you know, wanted to do this. And the, the I think the t-shirts were doing pretty well for them. You know, they were making money on those. And um and Razzmatazz were beginning to finance them. And I think, and I I have regrets about this because it was because it was something that I wasn't directly involved in. Um, but I remember the lady at the office just sort of said, oh, you're not earning enough money out of this. You need to earn more money. And so she basically had the meeting with, which I wasn't at, with Danny and um, the chap from Razzmatazz. And um, whatever it, whatever she said, she was obviously, so I know what she's like. She's very, she tends to be very rude to people. So I think she upset them because she was very rude to them. Mm-hmm. And second, she probably asked for some ridiculous amount of money, which was going to, you know, because her way of doing it would ask ask for a ridiculous amount, and then you you know level it down a bit, and um, whatever happened, it 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 messed up basically, and then um, which was a shame because it just fucked it all up, and then after that, uh, um, I think well, no, I don't think I know. I think Danny then tried to basically recreate what I had by trying to contact all the people in like my team, if you like, and Chris. And it didn't work out. Basically, I think they did one shoot. I know, I know, it just, it just didn't work that well. You know, they, um, Spencer, my stylist, wouldn't wouldn't do it because he, he he didn't think it was right, so he wouldn't do it. And I think, and I just don't think the shoot happened. Basically, it didn't work. You know, and I think it was a it was a shame. So I've always had regrets about that. And, of course, and I think also at that time, um, Cradle started being managed by a lady called Faith, who's who was I think Danny's equivalent to hey, well, then, on my yeah. side, you know. So yeah. uh, she she became, you know, I think any chances of reconciliation kind of got messed up with that. So I don't think it was so it wasn't really a case with me that I fell out with Danny or or things directly, but somebody there was a it was basically and with hindsight it shouldn't have it it I could have should have stepped in, you know, but it was one of those there was so much going on at that time that Cradle would weren't weren't a major they weren't the main part of all the stuff that was going on in my life, if you know what I mean. They were mm. they were an interesting part, but they weren't the the main bit because there was so much else going on with redemption and and other issues and you know all the stuff. And of course, the other the other thing I was going to mention about the t shirt was that I also because I'd made a film which uh, in eighty nine. Well, I made two films, but I made one called Axel, which was uh, a short film, erotic sort of film with um, soundtrack by Daniel Dax, which I'd released on. Uh, video and it done it done quite well actually and got my money back and then i used the the fact that i got my money back on that to raise some more money to make a bigger film which i which i did uh, uh, and i based it around um the um uh, catholic saint or uh saint teresa of avila which is a famous statue by bernini in rome and uh the ecstasy of saint teresa so I'd basically made it that, and Steve Severin from Susan the Banshees, uh, who I knew, was agreed to do the soundtrack. So it was all it was all fine. Unfortunately, that got uh, the BBFC British Board of Film Classification in the UK decided it was blasphemous, and it was a big, uh, big. Uh, so it became quite a big case in the UK, and I was charged with, um, amongst various things, of outraging the divinity of Christ, which I was rather being rather proud of. Um, but nonetheless, the 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 the. The unfortunate thing was it did actually get banned. And when a film's banned in England, it really is banned. I mean, you can't sell it or do anything with it. It becomes mm-hmm. completely banned. So all of my friends were saying, oh, wonderful, you make a load of money. And of course, the, the opposite is true. When it gets banned, it, it really, you can't make any money because you can't sell the damn thing. And um, But it then became a bigger case because my um, uh, Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, was banned the same year and or around the same time. And so... Madonna's uh, like a prayer video was also going on at the same time, and uh, my film for some reason I think uh, a lot of civil rights lawyers, including um, Jeffrey Robinson, who's another Australian but very quite a famous lawyer over here, um, basically they took up my case because it gave them a chance to challenge the UK law of blasphemy, and so it became a big case against me against the government. Um, and in those days, although the England was part of the was a member of the European Union, we we were the European law hadn't been incorporated into English law. So when you had a case like mine, um you had to basically take on the government and you had to 
uh, basically exhaust UK law first, and then you could take it to the European Court of Human Rights, who could rule against the UK government. Mm-hmm. So, and they wanted to do that because it gave them an opportunity, if I'd won, to abolish the law of blasphemy or get it changed. So it became a very big case, and um, it's costing a lot of money as well. And I had, obviously, I, I couldn't afford the sort of levels of money that you're, you're talking about in a case when you're taking on the government, you know, it became a big case. Um, and the government were, were involving the Lord Chancellor and the Solicitor General. So it was a, it was a big thing. Um, so uh, the, the lawyers were doing on a kind of pro bono basis because they wanted to, you know, challenge the law. Sure. And because it had to basically exhaust UK law, it, 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 it was very time consuming. And this was going on from 89, right in the back. So all the background time, time I was working in Cradle, in the background, quietly, was this big case building up. And every now and then it would get in the papers when judgment, there were various stages during this period when judgments were made. Uh, one of them was like, you know, the the, the European Court preferred um, uh, countries within, you know, with, to to um, settle their own affairs rather than rule against a particular government, you know. Mm-hmm. So on my case, the government said there were no grounds for a friendly settlement uh, in this case, which is, you know, basically that, that was it. And having exhausted UK law, we could then go to the European Court of Human Rights. So basically, while this was all building up, it, we finally got a hearing in Strasbourg, which is where the European Court of Human Rights is. Um, I can't remember which month, but it was in 1996. And in the background, the government were trying to say that I was a, a sort of scurrilous, you know, pornographer, you know, an awful person, basically. Mm. Whereas the lawyer's case for me was that I was um, a filmmaker, you know, an artist, if you like. Um, and then they shouldn't ban my film, you know, because it was a, my, my creative uh, right to, to to make the film and all the rest of it. So basically, you had the government trying to put me out. And, they, and of course, they... They um, uh, they describe redemption as you know as, as me putting out these awful films, mm-hmm. and um, anyway, they, they were, things were getting quite nasty basically. And then the hearing was set. It was a big hearing because we had like all the papers involved. The New York Times was coming over for covering it, and um, you know all the all the main all, all around the world, in fact, and, and um, at Aust- uh, an Australian one, which I'll mention in a minute. But basically, <laughs> it, was, it was a big case and a big hearing. And the the day of the hearing, the the government sent the, the Lord Chancellor and the Solicitor General was sent out with with a sort of team of nine other legal people. So it was a big, you know, big thing. Anyway, in the background of all of this, suddenly there were stories in the pa- in the papers about people being arrested for wearing this T-shirt which said "Jesus is a cunt" <laughs> on it. And my mean- lawyers went behind the scenes. My lawyers went absolutely bonkers because they said this is you you're involved in this aren't you they don't know what they thought because it was a nun basically on the front and i said well I just, you know i was involved with the picture and they said don't for god's sake you know let this come out and they were really you know because it if the law if the government had made a connection between that t-shirt and me anything to do with because i had no idea about the jesus to come thing because i had daddy asked me to shoot the the nun mm. mass aspect nun which was fine but i didn't know anything about the what the words are going to be on the back of the t-shirt so it was complete you know i, I knew nothing but it for the government that, that would have been irrelevant you know they could have just said jesus yeah. can't that's when got the t-. it would the link would have been made and that was all that would matter you know people would care so it would have destroyed our case and this would have been this was six and a half years of legal challenges uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds. So, um, it, luckily, it, 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 nothing happened. You know, we, but the the I can't tell you how because it all happened around literally the, the, those few days. You know, and there was a fear um, that the government some some link would be made. You know, so I remember I remember that as well. So that teacher's always st- st- stayed in my mind as you know what could have been a disaster. You know, from my point of view, but it was. Um, it wasn't, so it was fine, you know, but there was a thing. So the cradle, yeah, so the cradle stuff for me was, um, um, it, it was a, it was an interesting, it, it could have, I mean, my regrets with cradle is that it could have been creatively, which is what I, you know, basically what I, what I enjoy most, you know, that's my, uh, what, makes, what makes me work, you know, is that the, um, I felt I hadn't, I could have gone much further, if you know what I mean, because obviously the, the whole satanic stuff, 
it's really uh, you know I, later on mm. I did another magazine Rule Satania which we um, which was for the Church of Satan and then I had a nightclub called Black Mass which was sanctioned by the Church of Satan the only I think the only time they've ever done it ever they, mm. which was sanctioned by the Church of Satan you know and then because we had the Satanic Sluts which were all part of it so yeah. that dark uh, world if you like that sort of uh, creatively for me is very much you know where I am or and. I felt, and I was, it was funny because I, the album that they did after Dusk and Her Embrace, which has got the girl in the bath of blood, which I thought was a very Cruelty good cover. The beast, yeah. I, yeah, I thought that yeah. was very good. But after that, Danny went down a different route and was illustrative, basically. And, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Sorry, just on that point, it's it's yeah. been a source of, you've, you've answered so many questions through your monologue up to that point because fans, we were sitting there, Effectively, we had this wonderful merch with your imagery and Chris's photography, and it just bang gone, and it sucked. There's no other way to describe it. Ever yeah, since, it's a funny the, thing I, yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say it's a funny thing because I would, obviously I look at um, uh, bands and the whole the whole black particularly the black metal scene and stuff. And it, it, it it's become very uniform. You know, if you're dealing with Satanism or you're dealing with mm. know, darker areas of sexuality or or, or or religion or anything like that, the, it's become very uniform. A bit like they like to say the goth scene, you know, because you can take somebody, you know, they, they, it hasn't changed, you know, for 30 years now. It's just you know, people have the same look, you know, nothing changes. And it gets very, how should I put it, um, it just becomes very uniform and, uh, you know, it, it has a look and nothing, nothing changes. And it's, it's, for me, what was interesting with that area is that you can, you can do, you can go off, you know, you can go, you can look, well, how can I make, I'm trying yeah. to say, how can I make it different? How can I explore? And also in, in a sense, you have to, you, you can kind of not, not, prov- prov- yes, you can in a sense, you can almost provoke your own audiences because, you know, they have a, you know, they think it's all right to do with this and they're going to get the, you know, the, 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 the whole satanic stuff. And, you can, you know, you can do things for Satan. You can, you can twist it and, and do things that people don't expect. You can use colours that people don't expect. You know what I mean? You think, oh, everything's going to be black and do this, but actually, you can go off and you can start using, you know, bright colour. You can do things that that don't work. I mean, it's in, it's just interesting to me that you can. And I thought that there was a lot I I could have explored with Cradle or another band. You know, in a sense, it doesn't have to be with Cradle, but um, where. It, it, it's become a kind of quite stagnant. I mean, I thought Marilyn Manson, there was a period when he was making some very interesting, you know, videos and stuff, and they're doing some quite, you know, some quite nice stuff a few years yeah. ago. And, and, and is it Behemoth and stuff? Do things that, and, yeah. and I, can't, yeah. I just think and every now and then a band comes on that, that, that plays around. But I think you could, there's, there's an awful lot that can go, you know, that you could, that, that people could do in that area that they don't, you know, I think it's become, uh, um, Stagnant. Well, stagnant. Yes, in some ways, it has become a bit stagnant. You know. Yeah, um, they, so just, they conform to so-called genre norms, but they're really boring to your point. And that was what your imagery did for Cradle. It actually made them stand out. I I don't believe for a moment that the band would have had the success that Danny's enjoyed to this date if it wasn't for your imagery. So sure, the music's one thing, and that's what we know them for. But back in those days, in the mid-bloody 90s, do you remember what heavy metal was like back then? You know, Iron Maiden had yeah, gone yeah, out yeah, to no. pasture with, <laughs> with Blaze no, Bailey. It was, was yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, back, my musical taste, you know, say apart from the punk thing, which I loved, but when I was younger, I mean, obviously, there was Bowie and Alice Cooper, and then, but the other band I really liked, Pink Fairies and stuff, and Hawkwind I used to like, but I also liked Black Sabbath, and I really did like Black Sabbath, you know, and uh, I, I was lucky enough to see them when they were on tour, um, when they were promoting Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Nice. But they, they, but I liked, you know, their imagery, like their first, you know, their first album, you know, with the girl in the, the graveyard and all that stuff. I mean, and, and of course I grew up with Hammer, you know, so a, a lot of that, that sort of imagery was very important to me, but I, I, but what was interesting with the cradle stuff and with 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 things in here was was, I, mean, I mentioned the blood stuff with um with the girls and things, but I, I genuinely don't think that had been done before. I mean, it'd been done in obviously in horror films like vampires and and some of the hammer ones where girls obviously get blood on them, but when we first did that. I know because now it's there's, there's umpteen pictures, girls. You know, was always photographing themselves so covered in black. But when we, I know at the time we, I did that, I don't think anybody had done it. I mean, I, I'm not saying that. Oh wow, you know. But it, it was because we. I, knew, I didn't do it because 
oh, let's cover these girls in blood and have them kissing and make it, you know, make it all eroticized. It was just because I was doing a thing about vampires and it just seemed, it kind of just worked, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't some master plan of mine. I think, it, which I think is in a sense why it all um, kind of worked because it, I, I didn't have some great scheme. I'd also done this shoot with, um, in the same issue actually with uh, Chanel. And I had a friend of mine who was a, uh, she worked at the Sunday Times because I could, I could, somebody like me could not access the new, a new Chanel collection clothes, and they just brought out this um, uh, clothes with um, these. I can see it, but basically with these big boots that were quite fascistic looking. Mm. And we, I don't know if you can see it there. I'll send you pictures of these. But basically, this was the same issue, and I basically started playing around with um, the blood stuff, but also violence and sort of things. So we had, we had. Um, all this Chanel and I decided to call, call it uh, go go loco with Coco you know and we we basically had, we hired all these guns and there were two guys they had the head, like they had the longest hair I've ever seen I mean like down to the almost down to the knees but they their thing was into they were just into prosthetics and like they were just learning and starting out what did they work in film and, we, and they I basically said look we're going to do these things with these guns and we want to have the like a you know splat like a blunt thing and I said to Chris you know we're going to shoot this uh, and they basically they said they've never done this before and they put this um like an explosive charge behind the back of this girl's head and we had to um we had to sort of shoot at the studio I remember Chris and I said to Chris because it was like a still still like the girls are posing we had to go one two three and like shoot at that moment and it almost like blew the back of this poor girl's head off because all their hair sort of went and the blood went all over the it's all obviously fake blood obviously not her own blood yeah. but it went all over the studio you know I mean, it was a big studio <laughs> like all the ceiling everywhere and um but what i'm trying to say is that the that issue because i was um it was meant to be like you know a magazine that was um mixing um horror and stuff but i was also my interest i suppose visually was like creating quite fashion type imagery so I was mixing, I suppose, erotic fashion images or trying to with the violence that I thought that horror fans would like. So that's a scent. And when and the, the regime of that first issue got reviewed by The Guardian, of all things, and they called it a death vogue, which I thought I loved, you know. <laughs> but it was so essentially that was where I was coming from. It was it wasn't it was all so all of this was organic, you know what I mean? And then of course I was started redemption. So we would uh, I was doing the same thing then, and we had uh, and of course. I was un, I was beginning to immerse myself in that whole exploitation film genre, and there was things like you know Nazi exploitation. So again, we hired you know the, an SS gear. I mean, I, mean, we, I thought well, we'll just make them vampires as well, and chucked all the blood on, which because mm. they only used some of those, and they took the they took the uh, Nazi death's head yeah. off the hat, but essentially it was a still thing. I remember they, that. Yeah. They, they used some of those. So all of these shoots were just basically me mucking around and and immersing i suppose that um uh, you know the, the sort of what i thought or what i felt the exploitation cinema was with the, the things i loved you know which was basically sex, sexy girls and sort of fashiony images you know and uh and then and of course danny was there at that time you know with with because i was doing shoots with chris during that period I mean, several several times a month, basically. You know, we're shooting cover covers for the DVDs. We're shooting, sorry, the videos that they then were for the magazine uh, promotional stuff. Yeah, any because redemption, I said, redemption was growing quite fast then, so we were shooting a lot of stuff. And of course, from Danny's point of view, as I say, you just come round. Oh, I like that one. Can I use that one? Can I use that one? So that was, as I say, so it, if it hadn't stopped when it did stop, it would have been interesting. But because although, as I say, Danny often had. And whether it would have stayed like that, where I was just free, basically because he was just selecting pictures I was shooting for other reasons, but whether it would have stayed like that when he was saying to me, I want this, is, I want this, this, and this without any, because I, for me, I, I'm much better if somebody says, I'd like something along these lines. I, I know, as you say, a, a girl doing th this, and I'd say, okay, fine, and I'd go off and then mm -hmm. work out, something and i'll come back with a load of drawings and say this is what i'd like to do you know and then if they say oh yes that's fine and then i just basically agree a budget and we'll put it together you know and it would happen so whether i would have if, if whereas if danny had got too controlling you know i want this and it has to be exactly that then then of course it would in a sense he must have just direct the shoot himself so uh, i don't know but i don't know why he changed 
for the illustrators though, because because uh, a lot of other bands do that, you know. And secondly, it doesn't. It, I, to my mind, it, it 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 loses some some of that uniqueness in a sense, you know, because a photograph is kind of more real. It has a sort of uh, yeah. punch, you know. It's, a, it's, well, it's, it's authentic. Shame. Yeah, it was authentic and it was real and it was in the moment. Nobody had ever done it before. Nobody had married the two, particularly in that era, like you've already mentioned. It was very much about uh, upside down pentagrams and even swords and shit, even back then. You know, a lot of the Norwegian you could have all the, carrying the, on. The stuff coming out of Norway, the Norway yeah. and everything. Because that. Yeah. that was quite, I mean, 92, because uh, Cradle, what, 92, 93, they started, I guess, the first. They were around. Uh, that's when they that sort of emerged. Kind of, uh, yeah. Berzov and all the other, and Emperor and uh, Mayhem and stuff were all doing all their thing over in. Mm. So Cradle were pretty. Uh, to be fair to them, they were they were probably one of the first UK black metal bands, I guess. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And mm. they didn't try to be Norwegian or Swedish either. That was important because that that had been even by then. I remember back then there was a lot of bands emerging through the underground. You had your leading lights, the ones that you've mentioned, and mm. Satyricon. And uh, you, you couldn't go down to, you know, you couldn't, there was no, well, the internet was around back then, but it wasn't nowhere mm. near what it is now. But yes. uh, the magazines and fanzines that were around back then, they were the same black and white image, imagery with blokes walking around the course, playing forests and stuff like that. And yes. just about every band was doing the same. It was a trope, effectively. Then yeah. you came along with Cradle. Yeah. And yeah. so you had the music, but you had this enormous universe of imagery there used to be a shop in Sydney called Utopia and it used to sell the T-shirts and you'd go in there and they had an entire rack, you know, which was really unheard of back well, then. I wish, I, I wish I got myself a royalty on those. Okay. But, although, but at the yeah. same time, I mean, a lot of people say that to me. Uh, Gavin um, Gavin Badley, who wrote um, uh, a couple of the books and stuff, you know, he said that you, you're, uh, the, my image is a, 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 a loud a period of time for Cradle to evolve musically, you know, to catch up with the, with the, Very true. the you know the images and stuff, which I was I've always remembered, and um, yeah, because Gavin wrote the the book on the Cradle Gospel of Filth, you know the 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 yeah I haven't read it yet. Yeah, is it? Give, can you give me a bit of a the- not thesis, but a summary on that one? There is that is that a book that chronicles the band's early years, or is it something else? Well, I think I mean I, I've got I've got c- copies of it all because uh, because I had to give permission, you know, to for all the pictures to be used, which I, which I did, you know, um, didn't bother me. I think essentially what. I think that, um, Gavin was commissioned by Cradle to essentially to sort of a mixture of ghost writing, um, Danny's, the, the thoughts of Jem and Danny, if oh, you like. Yeah. You know, sort of yeah. Essentially, I think Danny was able to say, well, I mean, you know, was able to sort of go through all the all the sort of sources that one can, you know, so you're influenced by, you know, either Baudelaire or, or Swinburne or, or in all the sort of, tropes of the sort of satanism and dark culture if you like and then mm-hmm. gavin put all that put all that you know into into sort of intellectual speak you know and 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 it, and it was well illustrated so it's essential yes it's a it's a kind of catechism if you like of of cradle's danny's thoughts i mean um or, or at least sort of supervised by Gavin Badley, really, you know. So oh, yeah. I've never read it, but I, I flick through it. I flick through it a bit when it when it first came out, you know. But it's just another. I suppose it's another part of Danny's, you know, just laying claim to various aspects. <laughs> of, of, of laying of claim this. is a really good way to put it. I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. that look. That's the issue. And I, look, I've spoken to so many of the former band uh, members, and uh, they all have their own take, but. Uh, they all follow, a, can I call it a narrative? They all follow a similar narrative yes. strain, if you like, which is that Danny certainly sits at the head of the table. Uh, the musicians write all of the music. See, so Dan, Danny's not a writer, so he does some of the lyrics and might uh, influence the way some of the melodies evolve, but he certainly doesn't write any of the music. And uh, the, the music, musicians in the group have just been expendable, really, and uh, a few of them have what I'd call a legitimate axe to grind. Uh, but I suppose, saying, I suppose to his to his um, credit, but to, to his from his point of view, I mean, he has. I suppose he's kept the the cradle dream or vision, you know, alive for what thirty years now, something like that, it's a, which is quite a long time for a time. It's an amazing know, period, least, yeah, uh, yeah, for to I mean, I, I say I'm not really. In, um, I don't really. Obviously, it's a long time ago. The stuff when the stuff that I was doing, although just you mentioned corpse paint stuff, I did. Um, more recently, because I started, I was um, commissioned by a magazine. It doesn't exist anymore, but there was a magazine which you may may know called Bizarre. 
that was published over here for quite a long time. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Like, usually I either had really gory stories about people that saw their head off or um, you know, whatever, but or, or fetish stuff in there. But it was anyway, they get I have my own section in there um uh for a what for about a year and I could essentially do what I liked. And I got sponsorship because Bazaar had no money to commission. But I started working with Chris again during that period. And um what I would what I was basically given was a sort of four four to six pages, depending, uh, where I could choose a theme and I'd write about it and then but also illustrate it and I'd illustrate it with photography. And um one of the um first ones I did uh was actually writing about black metal. Um but the main reason for that was I um which I was quite pleased with. I, I again I mentioned this thing of trying to play around with that imagery and I got a couple of um fashion models and got the makeup artist to give them you know authentic corpse paint and everything and um it was, it was very unfortunate because one of the girls was uh, I think she was I think she was Danish actually or Swedish so she's very familiar I mean, she wasn't that wasn't her thing at all but she was very familiar with what black metal was mm-hmm. But she looked beautiful, you know, interesting. And we had that, we had, we had, we hired, I did hire, hire a big sword, sword for the shoot and everything else. But it was unfortunate because it was during London Fashion Week and she got a booking, uh, obviously for much more money than I was paying her. So she could only, she, she basically we started the shoot about half nine, ten. And of course, the makeup takes at least an hour or so. Um, and she had to, I think she had to leave at one. So it was a real shame because we both girls were made up and it was the first shoot I'd done with Chris for many years so he was a bit how should i put it tight i think is a, you know, a, bit, a bit tense it's better for mm-hmm. it tight a bit tense so you because we just started but that first hour or thereabouts the girls just started to loosen up and i got which i'll send you i mean i was really pleased them actually they just started playing around you know sticking you know like um sticking their tongues out and stuff and i was just beginning to get something something was going on if you know what i mean which mm-hmm. i felt was something new and because we were shooting against white not that that's particularly unique but it was it was it was just worked and there was something there was something happening beginning to happen i thought it was very unfortunate because the um this other girl had to leave so we, i still carried on with the one girl and we obviously got some nice shots but it, it was better when there was a two there was something there was a bit of chemistry going on there and i've i've kind of felt Again, I might go back to that, not with those two models, but something again. Uh, so I still work, you know, I still do shoots and, you know, mm-hmm. things now. Um, that I might go back, revisit that because I did, I did start to feel, you know, as I say, there's, 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 there's a way to go, you know, there's still stuff that can be done. It just, mm-hmm. it, the nice thing with it when you have a band is, you get a, if they've got a budget, you know, because these shoots are quite expensive, you know, by the time you pay models, makeup, stylists, studio, you know, props, uh, sort of post production work, and everything else, you know, the cost mounts up, so you can you can gobble up a few thousands, you know, quite quite quickly. But nonetheless, I I I do think there's there's um the scope there, so maybe you know, uh, you know, down the line, I'll still be able to come up with something that's, that's um. Uh, interesting to look at, you know, or has an impact like those ones did. Because I still like to produce something that, that, but I wouldn't want to. What I would, I would be trying to avoid would be just trying to recreate something that that, that was relevant then. For now, if you know what I mean, I, I would, I'd have to go off and try and do something that that you wouldn't be expecting. For instance, you know what I mean. It wouldn't be if somebody said, yeah, "Oh, nice it's, it's interesting." I agree with something you said early on. It's it, you've, it, it was a mystery to to. It was it was such a mystery, and you've solved that riddle, which is that why on earth did these beautiful images in conjunction with it on the band's merchandise? Why did it just cease? Why did it just stop? And I, I do I agree with something you said much earlier, which is that you had so much more mileage in you, and there was so much more that the partnership, so much more fruit from the partnership that could have been a uh, yield from it, if you yeah, like. I, and, I think also, I know, and I don't know this. I mean, probably Danny's the only one who can answer this, or maybe the guy at Rasmus has his name. I've forgotten now, but the the. Mm. Some, it, I don't know if they what, if they stopped or what the, the 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 reason was. I mean, there was a lot of, as I say, Faith, Faith was or Faith or whatever she's called was also quite um, difficult person. So I, I don't know if you know. I think there was yeah, obviously something that picture. Yeah, definitely yeah, something, yeah. Something, something around ninety six, ninety seven. 
you know, obviously uh, messed up, you know, or, or, or changed, you know, which is quite, I was, uh, that's what, 97, 20 years ago or so, isn't it? Over 23, it's quite a long time oh, back, you know. Almost 30 years ago, 25 Lifetime years ago, but yeah, it's, it is. I mean, it's, we were, I was, you know, nineteen twenty back in those days. And, uh, but the thing, the thing that I understand about Faye, yeah, she's a, she's a shrewd businesswoman, no question about that, but. Uh, but she's no longer in the picture, she's out, isn't she now? She certainly won't respond to my emails and my messages, so I think so. And uh, look, unfortunately, her uh, husband passed away last year. Kid, okay, yeah. So he he's the one who produced Dust and her embra- Dust and her embrace. He was the, you know the Thin Lizzy producer. Ended oh, okay. up getting that, yeah, even that cracking sound that they managed to produce. Uh, it pull off Dusk and her embrace with Stuart Ansis's uh, guitar playing, but I think the 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 other thing, the other factor is that. When Faye got involved, it was very noticeable that Danny became the focal point of the imagery. So the move away from these these beautiful women, things that we'd never seen before and, and really haven't seen since, really, to Danny being the focal point, and you've already mentioned him, a la Marilyn Manson. So there, Manson was big at the time, and it was and Rob Zombie. There was another one. There seemed to be this thing. Well, I suppose earlier, this, Alice Cooper, I suppose, in a sense, the, the, where he becomes the front of the band and everything's around to, him. Totally, and that's that's what happened. My opinion, observation. That's what happened when Faye got involved with Cradle of Filth. It became Danny and the Filths, and the band members. Les, that was an immortal line when he when he got kicked out or when he left. Either way, he said, uh, "It's Danny and the Filths now. The original spirit of this band is gone," and he wasn't wrong. Oh, I see. Oh, that's interesting. I, hadn't, I never thought of it like that, but actually, yes, uh, what you're saying does make sense. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's continued right through to, to, to now. Very much so. It's it's got to the point now where if I was to average it out, a band member leaves about once every eight or nine months. That's right across the span of the career, by the way. It'd be, it'd be greater than that, but I'm being forgiving when I'm saying that. But 42 tenured band members or something like that, there's no other band that's remained relevant in the public eye that has cycled through that many band members when they're actually – it is a band, if that makes sense. It's not just like Alice Cooper, as you're saying, you have these revolving door of musicians coming in and – the bloke who did the you know different drummers for different tracks on different albums, this type of thing, and uh, Danny deserves enormous credit for keeping it on the on the road. But it's it's very much uh, it's a legacy. It's a legacy act these days, like what Foreigner is or anything like that. It's uh, yeah. you got your hardcore fans, but you, you people like me who were around back in those days. It's uh, it's basically irrelevant yeah. nowadays. I'm curious. Just are, are there any? Um... Bands coming up, not I don't mean like another cradle, but are there any exciting bands that new ones, young ones coming up that are sort of making waves in the way that cradle made in that sense, in that scene, or is it not no. not really? No, I think yeah. those days are over. To be honest, mate, I think that was a that was a one time deal, like it is with a lot of scenes, and all of this is pre internet as well, so it had to be. It had to be something that had a buzz. You remember the real buzz? You remember Nirvana came out? They had that enormous buzz, and when I mean, you remember you remember the Sex Pistols? I mean, this stuff yeah. when it came out, it just felt you know it was part of your soul for a period of time. And the death metal and the black metal thing that was the last movement in heavy metal that really generated that sense of community, if you like, because it it you went to a show. And you saw people in Cradle of Filth t-shirts, like, oh, my people, this kind of thing. And these days you've got girls with blue hair and tattoos all over their face working in offices, as in, in law offices these days, <laughs> and for the state government departments and the like. So it's all sort of metastasized really and been uh, accepted. The alternative, if you like, has been accepted into the mainstream, and it more or less is the mainstream nowadays, especially yeah. with woke culture and all of that sort of stuff going on. Yeah. So. Which is why, just to finish off, then, as I said, that's in a in a sense, if one was going to look at something, you, in a, you, you almost have to attack the audience because they are so mainstream now that you have to do not, not you have to do it deliberately, but you want something that would ruffle their feathers, you know, because it's very, it's very, I mean, the mainstream. They are becoming the mainstream. So if, if you want to. If you want to ruffle something, it's they they are the mainstream now. You know, you have to do you have to do something, or something would have to happen organically that would, yeah, make them sort of. Well, they, these <laughs> days the most controversial, they, as you as you well know, in Britain and Australia and the US, Canada, the most controversial thing you can do is come out with a con- conservative opinion. That's that's subversive. 
these days. Yes, it's so yes, it ironic is. to see it flip on its head. So you flip on its head and and have these uh, woke mobs and these trolls doing their thing. And I think that's had a that's had a marked impact on what the question that you ask. In that, a lot of people are sort of scared to step outside in case they get called something racist. Yes sexist, homophobic, this sort of stuff. I mean, I, I I love your images and I see them for what they are, which is pure art. But I imagine that if someone came out with a new style of this sort of stuff these days, you'd get, unless the, the, the models themselves came out and said, look, we choose to do this, and of course they do evidently because they're being photographed, you'd, you'd face accusations of sexism. And it's it's ridiculous because it's art and art has always pushed the boundary. Yes, uh, I, yes, I mean, I'm, 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 I can't say what they are, but I've been working on it for the last five years on a on a, on a series of images for an exhibition. So, mm. um, which uh, which I know will be controversial when it uh, when it's when I finally finish, which will be about another year, I've got about a year to go, I think, before they're all done. So you'll, oh, you'll see. I hope, those it is. <laughs> I hope it is in a good way for you. You know, it gets, gets your work <laughs> out there and. You know, I'll, I'll finish on this point. It's uh, I, I mentioned it up top, so I'll finish on it again. I'll conclude with it, which is that your images have been incredibly meaningful, and your art direction has enhanced people's lives. And this is really a, a really important point. And I made this point with Chris: is that we're, we're, as as a young fellow growing up, having the music is one thing, but having these these images as well, it just it gives you something that uh, it makes you feel invigorated, if you like, knowing that someone's out there putting the effort and the work into doing this sort of stuff. And and the other thing too, it stood the test of time because nobody else has done it since. And I, and I wanted you to know that. No, that's good. I, yes, I, I don't. <laughs> yes, I, I, the fact that nobody else has done it since, I find, is um, kind of quite. Uh, Quite flattering, I suppose, in a sense, because it's um, it would be easy to um, well, just one would assume people, other people would go off and on do it, but it, it hasn't happened. It's it's uh, hmm. it's um, nice thing. But what I what I will do, I've got your email address, so it'll take me a few days to sort it out. But I'll get I'll definitely get it to you before the end of, by Friday, uh, which is Perfect. just a selection of stuff that we've been talking about. You know, sort of like the, 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 the I'll scan this and and I'll obviously I've got Polaroids, which would be interesting because I've got Polaroids from the that shoot with the girls with the blood. I've got that. I've got all the Polaroids from that session. I've got lots of Polaroids from the Dusk and Her Embrace shoot. You know, when we're putting the make the makeup on the model and and the original sketches. And I've got the sketches for the the Last Supper, if, if oh, you like. Wow. And, yeah. Um, oh, that'd Polaroids be lovely. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and Polaroids with Rochelle and um, and also the vampire the vampire shoot and the nun i've got all i've got basically because i kept the i always kept the photos so i just liked them you know this is in the days before everything went digital you know because when mm. uh, the photographer or chris or salvatore or whatever you know when they're testing the lights of course they do they take polaroids you know and so i used to keep them you know because i used to pin them all out but i've still got them so some of them are quite interesting actually just because they kind of give they're quite quite unique in a sense they sort of behind the scenes so i'll scan some of those and um some of the other stuff that, and I'll send you a couple of the um, the ones I meant, just to, you know the, the the ones of those girls I mentioned that I, that I did more recently with the corpse paint and stuff because I I rather like those and, and they were done by you know Chris as well so they'll tie in kind of nicely. I I truly appreciate, mate. Yeah, I can't tell you how much we appreciate. I appreciate it doing it. And the, the listeners and the the viewers of the YouTube clip will uh, appreciate it as well. It's uh, oh, I. I I, I can't understand why the media, the metal media, aren't more fascinated in the work that you've done to date, you know, the decibels and all of these sorts of people. I don't know why they haven't reached out to you and done a full... The only, well, the only one that did was, um, uh, I think he's Spanish. He wrote a, a published a book on um, uh, various... He's done two volumes of it, I think. Oh, I can't remember what the hell is it. I can't remember what it's called now. It's a, it's, it's a, but he basically did... Um, it's in English, but it's... A, uh, you know, like a, a, a sort of coffee table by, type book on various album covers and uh, yeah. and stuff. So yeah, I can't remember. It's a, it's annoying me, but um, that's the only one that did anyway. That's ever come to me and uh, and said they wanted to cover yeah. something. You know, I mean, I, look, I am a journalist. I'll allow that myself now. I'm, that's what I do. But uh, the, I don't work for uh, any of. I, I would never work for any of these so-called metal mastheads or whatever. I don't like what they do at all. Um, which is why I do what it is that I do, just as a hobby, effectively. But I'm the only mm. one doing it. I'm the only seem to be the only one reaching out to people like you and Chris and asking these questions. And uh, you only have to go on YouTube and see how appreciative the fans are to know that there's a there's a, a there's 
people want to know. They want to know what happened back then. They want to gain your insight. Oh, so you reckon that a few people will watch this one? Then? <laughs> oh yeah, this one's this one. I I, I messaged. When, I can't remember when I messaged you. Was it last year or was it this year? Uh, what with the cradle thing? It's either people like you know. Do you remember Sarah, the female who was the lady that was in the band? Um, yes, you know, yes, yeah, yeah. So I've been talking to her for, for the last two years or so, and she wants to have a chat and then she doesn't then she does and and i will i'll always be available whenever she wants to have a conversation because i think she's she's far too important to ignore in the band's full canon if you like but mm. that canon includes includes you too so when i go into wikipedia or encyclopedia metallium and i see your name and these other names like mike exeter uh the uh the engineer on dusk and her embrace uh, got a chat lined up for him hopefully soon, or at least I'm communicating with him. Some of the members flat out say no. They say, it's it's behind me. I don't want to do this. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of that that goes on. But, I mean, you get – I mean, I suppose Danny's the boss and, you know, I don't, I'm, you know any, any comments I have about Danny, okay, I understand. You, he's, we're all adults, meaning that you, if we've all been in shitty workplaces and if you don't like your boss, you just quit and get another job and sometimes it sucks yes. and you've invested a lot of energy and time in the role, but so what? Life, just roll with the punches, you know. Sometimes you're on the canvas and you've got to get back up again and uh, a lot of these guys, to their absolute credit, they've all done that. They've all gone on and led successful lives in the way that they want, I believe. Mm. Um, but it's such a huge... It's such a broad and deep. You wouldn't believe how deep it is, Nigel. Just the amount of people that are involved in Cradle of Filth in that era, because it really the band ended ultimately in about 1999, not long after you stopped being involved. That's so, right. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. There's, there, there's, there was a documentary on um, on the BBC about. I say documentary. Whether it was a yeah, living uh, with the enemy. Yeah. Was that with all the t-shirts? People kids wearing the t-shirts and stuff. I think or something like that. I can't oh, remember. okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah, there was one called "Living with the Enemy," which is in the era that you were. Oh, just afterwards, not in ninety eight. Yeah, that, yeah, um, that sounds about the way. Yeah, it, well, it was okay, but it's never BBC, seen it. But it was. So. Uh, I remember that coming out because that's when they started to become that they were going to be huge, you know. Yeah. Look, the the cradle guys are no different to me. We're all you know Catholic or Protestant, middle class. You know, go to well to do or you know better than average high schools and private schools if you know what i'm saying like we were all pretty much cut from the same cloth so if you've got a someone's mother in the room they're not going to start drinking and swearing at her you know what i mean so it just showed up that these guys were fairly polite guys from from middle class society as i mean i would, like who who would do that and, you know i know some people do that stuff for because they're idiots but the cradle mm. guys they were they were polite and respectful and that really came across in that no, fair enough. No, I, I say I haven't seen. It. I just remember. I just remember because I got my brain still to to uh, remember <laughs> various aspects of. Uh... This has been fantastic, Nigel. It's uh, I really do. I've said it a couple of times, but I'm just so grateful that you've made the time for this. It's uh, it's very meaningful. It's, it's, it's been interesting to do. Well, there you have it, Nigel Wingrove. What a fantastic fella. I'm going to put some links into the show notes if you want to check out more of Nigel's work, and of course, I encourage you to do so. Just another conversation added to the Chronicles of Filth. Wow, we're getting there. Who else is on the radar? Finally, Mike Exeter, maybe Sarah, maybe. And there's a few other members that are bubbling along in terms of the conversations, but nothing committed to just yet. As usual, watch this space. My name's Andrew Mackay smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. There's some messages about my book that are going to come up rather soon. But before we get to that, I need to bid you a fond farewell. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. The messages and the support that I receive for the Chronicles of Filth, yeah, it's very much appreciated. So until next time, it's a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point 
where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>